My grandson is biracial, and his nana, his grandmother, is African American. Like many older people, nana has high blood pressure. And most of us, as we get older, will get different kinds of health problems, like high blood pressure or diabetes, that are very manageable with good medical care. We'll continue to live active, normal lives, like Nana, until suddenly, for some reason, we don't. A health problem, or a combination of problems, that's been stable for years gets suddenly worse, and we get very sick, or could even die sooner than we should have. But what if we could predict when someone is about to get that sick? Most of Nana's doctor visits and medications are covered by Medicare. Medicare is the national health insurance for Americans over 65 years old. And Medicaid is emergency insurance for people with very low incomes. Both are essential to covering medical care costs in the United States. But both of them are getting dangerously expensive. This is a graph of how much Medicare costs have risen since it started in 1968, much faster than the rest of the economy. This red line is Medicare at the top. The blue line is other health care expenses. And the dotted lines are economic growth measures since 1968. So the higher percentage of our national wealth that we spend on health care costs, the less there is for everything else. For schools, roads, trains, parks, public safety. And even if we keep cutting back on all those other things, we're eventually going to run out of money for Medicare as more and more baby boomers turn 65 and there are fewer working age people paying into the system through their income taxes. I don't think Nana needs to worry about Medicare going away in her lifetime. But the frightening and very real possibility is that it could go bankrupt by the time my grandson is old enough to need it, after he's paid into it for his whole life. But what if we could slow down the growth in Medicare and Medicaid costs and keep patients healthier at the same time? Four years ago, Medicare and Medicaid asked the University of Missouri School of Medicine to find ways to achieve this goal of lowering health care costs and making patients healthier at the same time. So our first step was to hire 22 experienced nurses to take care of 10,000 Medicare and Medicaid patients between doctor's visits. Now, a dime of prevention is often worth a dollar of cure, right? But if you have 22 nurses taking care of that many patients, they can't help every patient every day. So the medical school hired me to analyze the data and figure out which patients need care most immediately. 5% of patients nationwide, 5% of patients use about 50% of all health care resources every year. But we don't want the nurses to focus on the 5% of patients that were sickest last year. We want them to give preventive care to those who are going to be sick next year. So as you might imagine, um, a lot of the people that are going to be sickest next year were already sick last year. And that's good in a way, because those people are already being followed closely by their doctors. And some people that are healthy now, but look most likely to be sick next year, some of those could be false alarms. That's OK, because if we spend some extra preventive care resources on people, it's not going to do any harm, and it won't cost very much. But if we could pretty accurately predict a few hundred of those 10,000 people who are going to be in the sickest 5% before they get that sick, that could make a huge difference. There's a lot we don't know about when someone with chronic health problems is going to get very sick. African Americans have high blood pressure more often than white Americans. And whites are uh, more likely to get abnormal heart rhythms, these kinds of things we know. 
What we don't know is how race and age and gender and other things combine to predict when those chronic health problems will become health crises. So one doctor seeing one patient at a time is never going to see all the combinations that could make those predictions. And I'm a doctor, but also a data scientist. So I'm building computer models to look at the health histories of thousands of patients and find patterns in who gets sick, when, and why. There's a lot we do know about our patients. Um, my computer models look at all the things that your doctor would see looking at your medical chart, age and race and gender, past diagnoses, any prescriptions you're taking, your height, your weight, whether you're married. My computer models are looking at thousands of facts for thousands of patients to find the hidden combinations that no one thought to look for. If we look at all the things that are in your medical chart, we know about 25,000 things about our patients. And we also know some important things about where you live. Your doctor doesn't know whether you're rich or poor. But that's important because study after study shows that people with lower incomes or less education have worse health care and worse health outcomes. Now, it's probably not ethical for your doctor to ask you, how much money do you make? It's certainly awkward. But if I know your address, then I know whether your neighborhood is rich or poor, which tells me something about how rich or poor you are and how much education you likely have. And it tells me some other important things, like whether your neighborhood makes it hard to exercise every day, or is a long way from healthy grocery stores, or has a high crime rate. I know 6,000 additional facts about the neighborhoods that our patients live in. And knowing all these things tells me even more about who's likely to get sick next year. So if, if I have a table that's 10,000 rows long, that's a row for every patient, that's not what data scientists call big data. But if it's also 31,000 columns wide, that is big data. You've seen me trying to avoid the problem here, how to walk around the problem. The possible combinations of 31,000 facts, there are 10 billion, 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 billion combinations. More than there are atoms in the universe. And trying to get the important data out of all those combinations is like trying to get a drink of water from the blast of a fire hose, right? But using a supercomputer that we built and some innovative data mining, I can start to narrow down those combinations. That, that number, which is 46 digits long, I can use something called the a priori algorithm and narrow it down to a number that's only five digits long. 13,422. So a priori means deducing new knowledge from your prior knowledge. It means that um, if I build up a branch of a branching tree of possible combinations, and it starts by building simple branches, like the combination of being female and having had kids. So if those two factors are not predictive of being sick next year, then all the billions of combinations that include those two factors are also not useful. It builds up billions of branches and narrows it down to a tree that's deep and very narrow. In this case, only 13,422 branches wide. Still way too wide. Still drinking from a fire hose. So the next step, and I have to tell you, when the results of this next step came back from the supercomputer, I literally 
heaved a sigh of relief. If I look at the individual factors that are in those 13,000 combinations, there are only 60 unique things about our patients that are most predictive. Now that's a number that is small enough that I can do traditional statistics on a regular desktop computer. And when I do that, a very few things rise to the top, become statistically significant. In one of my preliminary models, these eight things show up. Now, I can build a model based on these eight things, and the nurses can treat patients with any combination of these as being most likely to get sick with 74% accuracy. Okay, the state of the art for this kind of predictive model is about 70%, so this is cutting edge pr predictive accuracy. And this set, it's it's preliminary data, but it's interesting because the first five things are the kinds of red flags that any doctor will tell you are very good predictors of who's going to get sick or who's going to die early. If my model weren't finding those kinds of things, we'd know something's wrong. I'm missing the obvious. But the reason we already know those five things is because doctors had a hunch based on their experience and someone tested those five theories. My model is testing 31,000 things and finding some things we weren't looking for, like opioid prescriptions and steroid shots. It may be that those kinds of medicines are very risky. Uh, if they're used too long, they have too many side effects. And both of those prescriptions are used to treat chronic pain, so it may be the underlying painful conditions or the chronic pain itself that causes bad health outcomes. We need to look closer. We need to use more models on different groups of people to find out more answers. This last thing is the most interesting. I was really surprised when I saw that patients age 45 to 64 are more likely to get sick than patients over 65. Until I remembered that in order to be in the group of patients that I was studying, you have to either be on Medicare, which means you're over 65, or on Medicaid, which means you're very poor. So I don't think it's because they're young that this group showed up, it's because they're poor. It means that they're in a vulnerable population that needs extra preventive care. And when I looked closer at this group, I found in fact, that divorced Caucasian males, age 45 to 64, are at the highest risk. And I found another vulnerable population, African-American females over 65, like my grandson's Nana. So we don't know exactly why divorced white men under 65 and black women over 65 get sick more often. One reason could be that both those groups go to the doctor less often for different reasons. If that's true, then it's even more important that those nurses make sure that those patients are coming in to see the doctor when they should. Caucasian males who are divorced might be more vulnerable to depression. And these women do have higher rates of breast cancer and kidney disease. But if we were only looking at those specific diseases, those diagnoses, we'd miss the big picture. It's when we look at everything we know about our patients, when we look at everything and narrow it back down to a small enough number that we can work with, that these people become visible. So we have to look at the whole person and their surroundings. And to do that, it takes a team of nurses, and doctors and data scientists. Americans are getting older, sicker, and more expensive to care for. My computer models can identify the people who are most likely to get sick so that nurses can get extra care to those people 
before health crises start. Keeping Nana out of the hospital not only makes her healthier and makes my grandson's life happier, but it keeps her and all of us wealthier because everyone who pays taxes or pays insurance premiums will benefit from the savings. So a healthier Nana and lower medical costs. That's what I'm giving to my grandson <laughs> and his generation. Thank you. Thank you.